Back when Congress passed the Space Act in 1958, which would mark the beginning of NASA, the US manned spacecraft relied primarily on rockets derived from the military's ballistic missile programs. For the Mercury and Gemini programs, despite their complexity, the Air Force was able to provide the required support for the launch vehicles and related logistical hurdles. However, the Apollo program was a totally different beast to handle not only due to the increased size and complexity of the vehicles that would need to be built, but also due to the fact that NASA intended to supply its own vehicles. Also, lunar flights were strictly dependent on launch windows, which align with compatible trajectories of the orbiting moon and the spacecraft, so avoiding any sort of slippages on the schedule, especially during the final weeks prior to launch was crucial. The logistics process required careful planning and coordination as it involved numerous components from over 20,000 contractors and subcontractors from all over the country that needed to be completed and delivered on time. Delays could jeopardize launch, hence the need for a tightly controlled logistical process to ensure components were assembled, thoroughly checked, and shipped to Cape Kennedy on time for the final assembly of the rocket. The Saturn V required 56 railroad tank cars to supply its necessary propellants, and the various stages for one launch vehicle spent up to 70 days in transit at sea before arriving at Cape Kennedy. Werner von Braun, a key figure in the program, emphasized the importance of logistics he said that logistics were often taken for granted and that they could account for as much as a third of the entire program's budget, so even the slightest of improvements would save them a lot of money and time. However, despite the importance of logistics, it was a program element that was slow to develop and initially overlooked, even disregarded. Initially, many officials felt that military-style logistics were not needed due to the small number of launches and single launch site that the Apollo program would have, compared to a hypothetical national defense situation where ballistic missiles could launch at unscheduled times from widely scattered launch sites in unanticipated circumstances, but this assumption quickly turned out to be mistaken. As I mentioned earlier, factors like the size and complexity of the Saturn rocket, the pace of the program, and the number of technicians and suppliers involved, among other reasons, made logistics management an absolute necessity. Corrective measures were implemented in the early 1960s. This resulted in a reorganization of the logistical structure, with contractors now formulating logistical process reports and plotting all developments against logistical control charts. Plus, all hardware managers got their own logistical managers. And so, by 1963, NASA finally established its logistical management, leading to a significant reduction in logistics-related problems. However, this new restructuring didn't come without its own set of problems, probably the most pressing one being the lack of additional funding to address the issues that arose from developing such a massive logistics program. That meant that they basically had to work with what budget they had available and make trade-offs. To quote from the book Stages to Saturn, which is the source I am getting this information off of, the program manager began to rob Peter to pay Paul and sometimes found himself in a dilemma. The Department of Defense was also part of the logistical program, supplying some of the propellants and pressurants for the Saturn rockets. But what did all this logistical tangle really look like? So the logistics involved a transportation network that spanned across the nation. Initially, it was feared that uh, transporting these stages would compromise their reliability due to possible damage incurred during transit, especially given the stages' sensitivity to vibrations and handling. The initial proposed solution was to use existing transporters designed for Redstone and Jupiter missiles, but these proved inadequate for the larger Saturn series. The subsequent disassembly and reassembly process involved in this approach threatened the integrity of the rocket stages. Another proposal was to use a huge amphibious bark style transporter. Bark stands for barge, amphibious, resupply, and cargo. The US military used them for uh, over the shore delivery of heavy tanks and other cargo but its dimensions, maneuverability issues, and cost led to this idea being abandoned. Instead, it was decided to use 
towable transporters for the Saturn vehicles and to utilize seaworthy vessels for waterborne transportation. The transporters employed a roll-on roll-off operation utilizing ground transporters to wheel the stage onto a barge travel with it and then unload it at the destination. This approach was believed to cause the least amount of damage to the stages during handling and transportation. The actual movement of the stages from the assembly and test facilities was executed through specialized transporters designed to carry the massive load of the stages. These included large circular assembly jigs for the Saturn 1 stages and a modular wheel concept for the larger Saturn 5 stages. These transporters were towed by large army truck tractors at about 8 km per hour through the manufacturing areas and onto barges for their journey to the launch site in Florida. The transport of these stages required unique pathways including specially designed roadways in Huntsville and Michoud and extensive use of barges and canal systems. However, in urban areas like California where contractor plants were located, special permissions and extensive planning were needed to navigate such heavy loads upwards of 25,000 kilograms or 50,000 pounds on public highways, railroad crossings and all sorts of urban congestions. Traffic had to be rerouted, commercial vans and trucks, as well as local school districts with extensive bus schedules had to be called into consultation when planning the logistics of transporting these rocket stages overland. Finally, the transportation of Saturn's engines relied on more conventional means, often being flown to Huntsville by the US Air Force Military Air Transportation Service or transported by truck or boat to Michoud. Now, let's have a look at what vessels NASA used for the waterborne transportation of various parts of the Saturn vehicles during the Apollo program. This began with a Palemon which carried the first Saturn I stage from Huntsville to Cape Canaveral. The USNS Taurus and the barge Poseidon were used for transportation of the larger second stages of the Saturn 1B and Saturn V. Meanwhile, the open deck barges Little Lake and Pearl River were used for transporting the first stage of the Saturn V rocket. Smaller tanker barges were also used to transport liquid hydrogen and oxygen to support static test firings. All these vessels formed a crucial part of NASA's logistic operations, helping to facilitate the testing, refinement, and transportation of rocket stages. Now, for the upper stages of the Saturn I and the Saturn IV rockets, which were built in California, they had to be transported via sea barges and transports moving down the Pacific coast through the Panama Canal across the Gulf of Mexico and Florida to Cape Canaveral. These transports sometimes required detours to Huntsville for tests at the Marshall Space Flight Center facilities before finally reaching Cape Canaveral. And this was a slow and complex operation with potential delays due to bad weather Moreover, there was also the fear of a potential shutdown of the Panama Canal, which would have caused massive delays, forcing the shipments to go around South America and uh, putting the carefully planned launch schedules at risk. Due to these concerns, NASA began exploring other modes of transportation for the upper stages, starting with the Saturn I upper stage. The large size of this stage rolled out delivery by rail or road, so in 1960, Marshall Space Flight Center contracted the Douglas Aircraft Corporation to study the feasibility of air transport. The Douglas team proposed a piggyback concept using an Air Force C-133 transport with a rocket stage positioned above the airplane, similar to what was later done with the first shuttle test flights. Other suggestions included other airplanes, gliders, and even lighter-than-air vehicles such as blimps or modern successors to pre-war dirigibles, which could carry the rocket stages in an internal cargo hold. But none of these ideas ended up materializing. Then a man named John Michael Conroy, who owned the company Aerospace Lines, came up with an idea to create a unique spacecraft that would be capable of transporting Saturn rocket stages for NASA by Earth. Conroy, inspired by his team's experience with transcontinental and intercontinental transportation of the Douglas Tor Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile, envisioned the transformation of Boeing B-377 Stratocruisers into volumetric aircraft capable of swallowing a second stage of a Saturn 1. Despite skepticism, 
from many engineers, Conroy was able to convince influential executives at Douglas Aircraft Corporation and eventually Dr. Vanna von Braun, who at the time was the Marshall Space Flight Center's director, of the feasibility of his concept. The modified aircraft involved lengthening and widening the fuselage of a Stratocruiser to accommodate the rocket stage, resulting in a humpbacked look, earning it the name Pregnant Guppy. It was designed to be a self-contained cargo transportation system with a fuselage that separated just aft of the wings to allow for the loading and unloading of the rocket stage. However, financial issues threatened the project, prompting Conroy to seek endorsement from NASA. He actually flew the newly built aircraft with his crew and landed it at the runway of the Army's Redstone Arsenal, a facility shared jointly by Marshall Space Flight Center and the Army. He was met by skeptic and enthusiastic enthusiastic folks alike. Some of them were making jokes about the bizarre looking airplane, but you know, von Braun was actually pretty impressed and with both time and money in short supply, Conroy wanted to pull off a demonstration flight to showcase Guppy's ability to fly heavy loads. The pregnant Guppy was thus validated as a viable solution to the challenge of transporting large rocket stages despite initial skepticism. And so, pretty soon, this one-of-a-kind aircraft was seen as a vital asset for the space agency due to its ability to transport huge equipment over large distances in a very short period of time, usually taking less than a day to transport a rocket stage from California to Cape Canaveral compared to the 18 to 21 days that it would have taken by ship. NASA also expressed interest in even larger aircraft for bigger cargo. This interest led to the development of what would have been called the very pregnant guppy, but ultimately stayed as super guppy, which was essentially a larger version of the pregnant guppy. Despite minor incidents and weather-related disruptions, the super guppy was crucial for transporting even larger items such as the second stage of the Saturn 1B and Saturn 5, the special environmental chamber used for final preparation of the manned Apollo command module prior to launch, cryogenic tanks for an experimental nuclear rocket, and so on. And even though super guppy faced occasional technical issues and design challenges, the aircraft performed reliably, particularly during the sometimes tightly scheduled Saturn 1B and Saturn 5 launches. John Guthrum, head of Marshall Space Flight Center Logistics, stressed Guppy's exceptional value to NASA. He noted that while the Guppy operations didn't necessarily save the Saturn program, their absence might have forced NASA to cancel some launches, resulting in substantial time and financial costs. Now, there were some of you asking whether SpaceX kind of avoids such a big logistical nightmare with Starship by uh, having a centralized assembly hub, and the answer is absolutely. Yes, they still need to import the materials to build their hardware, but all the construction and testing happens within a relatively small area. I think the longest they have to wait for are the engines coming from McGregor and maybe the cryogenic liquids, but uh, other than that, it's all a very centralized operation with very low transportation costs, at least compared to what NASA had to spend in shipping so many rocket parts from so many different spots all over the country. And uh, don't get me wrong, the logistics behind Starbase and the whole Starship program is of astronomical dimensions, but luckily it is not the hell that it was during the Apollo program. And none Nonetheless, humans managed to pull that off. So, as you can see, the orchestration of the Apollo program in the 1960s required a unique and complex logistics operation, an operation that was characterized by tight launch windows, intricate production schedules involving thousands of contractors, a broad geographic dispersal of production and test sites, and a vast array of unique and outsized equipment. And so, in order to overcome all these challenges, NASA had to implement rigorous logistics strategies and systems which ended up being critical to humanity ultimately landing on the moon. So enough for this video I say, I hope you enjoyed it and please let me know if you want me to make more videos like this one in the future, perhaps delving deeper into more specific topics of the Apollo program. So goodbye for now, uh, have a nice day wherever you are on this planet, take care, bye bye.